Thank you. A pleasure to see so many come out for what it promises to be an outstanding presentation. I'd like you to take a moment and imagine that you're a mountain climber. You've spent five years putting together your expedition. You've gotten yourself in shape. You're down in, in some very uh, exotic country. You're struggling up the mountain. You're pushing through the storm. You're pushing up the side. You're going to make it to the top. You come over the crest, and there's Lonnie Thompson walking down the mountain carrying an ice core. And he says, hi, how's it going? It's a nice day. Be careful of the big crevasse. <laughs> This is real. This happens to people, okay? Because Lonnie not only climbs mountains that, that, that would daunt the strongest of mountain climbers, but he comes down off of the mountains with science. And it's phenomenal. And it's, it's heroic, and, and it's, it's wise. And Lonnie went to Ohio State to be a coal geologist. And he got a job working on ice cores from the old bird station ice core, one of the, the great triumphs of first core through the Antarctic, and he characterized the dust in it and learned what you could learn about the dust, and he was on his way to being a, a polar ice core specialist, and he said, you know something? Most of the world is not the poles. And I know ice, uh, and I know that there's a lot of world out there. How can I put these two things together? And so he did, and he is the person that has taken the ice of the tropics, the ice from where people live, and has told the story and what it says about the climate and how that climate change correlates with where people lived and how they lived and what it says about what's going to happen in the future. Um, he is the distinguished university professor of geological sciences at Penn State. He has either won or will win all of the major awards that anyone in his field could possibly win, including the Tyler Prize just recently. Lonnie for 20 years, and I've been 20 years because he's also a genuinely nice guy. And so without further ado, Lonnie Thompson telling you about ice adventures, tracking evidence of abrupt climate change across the tropics. Thank you, Richard. It's my uh, <clears throat> pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Uh, here at the Harrington Symposium, and uh, I've had a, a, a great time here so far, and the lectures this afternoon were tremendous. And I, uh, uh, and I uh, really want to thank all the organizers for making this possible. I also want to point out that what I do is a team effort. I have a great team at Ohio State, but I have a team around the world uh, where we work. We've, we've drilled now in 15 different countries. Uh, there's some really super people in this world that make what we do possible. Uh, I want to start with uh, a take-home message uh, right up front. Uh, the Kelkaya ice cap was the first tropical ice cap that we uh, measured. Uh, and we did this back in the uh, uh, early 70s. We made the first trip down there. And for young people, I think this is, there's a story here that... Uh, you should, uh, you should be aware of. And uh, that is that uh, when we first set out to look at the tropics, there really wasn't a funding agency uh, for doing this type of work. Uh, we took the aerial photographs of this ice cap to uh, uh, the program manager at National Science Foundation uh, and showed him the ice cap. And we were interested in comparing, connecting Antarctica with... Uh, uh, is this working? Or, uh, maybe it's... Okay, all right. Um, uh, with uh, Greenland. And in doing this, uh, I'm going to change that. Here. So I got it. So I got it. Okay, good. Uh, well, the, uh, the problem was that at that time the research was being done in, uh, in both Antarctica and Greenland. And uh, if uh, the funding agent, uh, uh, who was a very nice guy, he said, you know, I can't really fund this project because it's not north of the Arctic Circle and it's not south of the Antarctic Circle. And so I actually had gone to Bird Station. And Sorry. I think it's supposed to go over here. Yeah, that feels, feels a lot better. Okay, good. <laughs> Makes a difference. Uh, all right. Uh, so I was actually going to, went to Bird Station in Antarctica, and at the end of the season, I got a, 
a telex from the program manager saying that he had funded all of his real uh, science projects and he had $7,000 left. And what could we do on this tropical glacier for $7,000? So all I'm going to talk about started from that initial $7,000 and actually size gap. But this is a, a view of the margin of that ice cap uh, as it appeared in 1977. And it's a, it's a beautiful picture because you can actually see how uh, climate is archived. Uh, in the tropics, we have a very strong wet and dry season. So each of those layers is an annual layer. So you can see how if you have a drill, you could recover that uh, record and get a history in parts of the world where we know very little. Uh, the photograph on the right uh, uh, was taken in 2002. It's taken at the same place. And, and it brings home the story that not only is the ice retreating, but we're also losing a valuable archive uh, of the past. Um, the, um, and that's uh, a part of the, uh, the message I want to talk about tonight. Now, as part of these programs, we get, we get uh, graduate students who come from uh, universities around the world. And uh, uh, in 2003, we had a fellow, Ryan Vaishan, who's an isotope geochemist. He's, he's getting his degree in that. But what he really wants to be um, is a science producer. And, you know, we need good people <coughs> who can bring the science uh, to the public. And, and I think he has a, a lot of talent. And he produced a movie for the Banff International. And what I'm going to do is just show a couple minutes at the, of, of the introduction of that on one of these uh, uh, tropical ice caps. Peru is a country along the west coast of South America, chock full of wildlife, natural environments, history, and culture. It's thought that humans first migrated to Peru over 10,000 years ago, as our last ice age was coming to an end. Early Peruvian cultures rose and fell following the ebb and flow of drought until the Incas. The Incas, who have their roots in Cusco, Peru, first came into being around 1100 AD. They conquered much of South America, but were known for their benevolent rule. Between the mid-1300s and 1500s, the Incan culture spread until the Spanish invaded in 1531. Since then, Peruvian culture has been strongly influenced by Europe and the West, but they hold tightly to some of their native roots. There's a steep gradient between those connected to the world market and those living in smaller communities. To this day, many Peruvians tie themselves to Pachamama, or the Mother Earth, from which they grow their foods and use the water resources. Found so closely to the environment, they're very susceptible to changes in climate. Like has happened in the past, could a sudden change in climate devastate their culture? Are we in the middle of a climate change? There's a lot of evidence out there suggesting that we are. You can see how far back this glacier in the eastern Peruvian Andes has receded in a little over 20 years. How can we learn more about these issues? How can we stretch our understanding further back into the past? Being a climate scientist and a mountaineer, I had the good fortune of being invited on an expedition with scientists from the Bird Poor Research Center who were trying to get to the bottom of some of these questions. Led by Dr. Lonnie Thompson, our goal was to take ice cores from two high-altitude Peruvian ice caps. In areas where temperatures rarely even approach the freezing mark, snow accumulates year after year. Hundreds, even thousands of years of snow can then be drilled up. This snow is not just frozen water. It comes with other compounds like dust and salts. The chemistry of snow records the climate from which it came. With these tools, we can estimate what climates were like long before humans even started to record temperature. Okay, so uh, this is just the beginning of what was in our production that he put together. But I think for reaching uh, 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 young people, uh, people, graduate students, getting them interested in science, uh, it's, it's a marvelous way uh, to do it. But um, the cores uh, that come from these glaciers, as well as uh, from the polar regions, record many different things in our environment. And uh, it's very much an interdisciplinary activity. And you can see uh, here just some of the uh, 
uh, the, the various parameters that we can measure about the environment recorded in, in these cores. Uh, this is actually a core from western China, so you can see the monsoon climate, the, 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 the clear areas, and then the dry seasons in between. So often you can actually, in the, in the lower latitudes, date these cores as they're being drilled. But there's, uh, there's a history here of everything from atmospheric chemistry to uh, the accumulation to dustiness of the atmosphere, how deserts have changed, the wind speeds have changed through time. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, comes from these lower latitude glaciers is the record of veg vegetation. There's pollen preserved uh, in these cores. And uh, a volcanic history, looking at tephra and sulfate, uh, anthropogenic emissions uh, of the, the, the uh, uh, the greenhouse gases that come from the cores, particularly from the polar regions, but also methane measurements that can be made on the low latitude cores. And uh, more recently, we've been looking at microorganisms entrapped in the ice. Uh, but there, there's a, a number of things you need to do this type of research. And over the years, we've built uh, laboratories for this. Uh, there's a class 100 clean room in which the chemistry and the dust is measured on the cores. Uh, we have built a storage facility. We have uh, 7,000 meters of cores stored at minus 30 degrees C. This turns out to be the only tropical collection of cores uh, on Earth. And, and it's become more valuable as we've realized the, that these, uh, a lot of these sites, the ice is disappearing. Uh, and then the other part of it is the drills to recover the cores. We have our, our own engineer. We design and build the drills that we take out to uh, re uh, records. And you really need all of that, and most of all, you need a great uh, team uh, to bring all of this together. Uh, and if you look at how a history comes from ice, uh, this is an example from uh, Greenland, but uh, you, the, probably the most important thing is, is timing of any paleoclimate record. And we're really lucky with ice that we have a number of annual signals that can be used for dating. And here's an example of uh, using dust and uh, nitrates and uh, looking at uh, sulfates and uh, isotopes. And <coughs> the, the dust and the nitrates and, and the isotopes have an annual signal. And you can verify that it is annual by known events like the eruption of Tambora. Uh, the eruption was in 1815. The sulfate comes out in the polar regions in 1816. If you're in the tropics, it comes out in the 1815. So, uh, but these, these are ways to, uh, uh, to date these cores. Uh, earlier today, uh, we saw uh, this record uh, in uh, various forms. Uh, this has come from uh, Richard Sally's book, uh, The Two Mile Time Machine. But these huge oscillations showing very abrupt change in the polar regions, and uh, uh, Thomas Stocker was indicating that we now know that some of these uh, uh, are represent 8 to 15 degrees C temperature changes over very short periods of time, showing that the system, in, 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 at least in the high latitudes, uh, records these very, very abrupt events. Uh, I want to go to the tropics and look at abrupt events uh, in this part of the world. This is an ice core actually being removed from um, uh, the call on Mascaran at uh, 20,000 feet in the Andes. And uh, this shows the places where uh, cores have been recovered uh, by the, uh, our group at Ohio State. So each of these dots. and. Uh, the reason the tropics are important, it can be seen here. We've, we've got 50% of the surface of the planet between uh, 30 north and 30 south. Uh, we have 70% uh, of the 6.4 billion people that live on the planet in this zone. This is also where <coughs> the energy that drives the climate system of the Earth is received. So it's an important place to, to have records, and particularly uh, places that, where you can actually look at the history of cultures and look at what was going on in the environments long before there was actually a, a written language in some of these uh, areas. Uh, some of the uh, most uh, recent sites we've drilled, uh, the Bona Churchill up in southeast Alaska. Uh, initially, you may not think that that would be connected to the tropics, but we know that over the last 100 years, when you have the warm uh, phase of ENSO, uh, which impacts our, our records in South America and over in, in Kilimanjaro, uh, you also have the positive phase of uh, of uh, PDO. And here we have a record that goes back annually for 1,500 years. Uh, it's a 476 meter core, which makes it the longest ever recovered from any mountain range uh, on Earth. Uh, in the tropics uh, in 2003, uh, uh, we, we had an opportunity to 
uh, redrill, the very first place we had drilled over 20 years ago when we didn't have the technologies or the lab techniques uh, that we have today. And I'll show uh, a little bit from that. Uh, the, uh, what we do could not have been done in any other time in man's history. Uh, the technologies that we use, uh, the lightweight Kevlar cable, uh, uh, the drills uh, we have to take to these very high elevation sites, uh, this just wouldn't be possible. Uh, the geodesic dome here was designed and built by a master student in mechanical engineering. So they get to design the structures and then they get to go out in the field and actually test those structures. Uh, the, the coring on the summit of uh, uh, Corapuna and the ability to look at, uh, in this case, uh, airflow that during La Nina has actually come off the Pacific. This is about 21,000 feet. Uh, and one of the things with these ice cores is you're always surprised what you find. In the tropics, uh, I, I said there were, there's pollen in these cores, but there, there are also insects in these cores. And you wouldn't expect to see that at uh, 21, 22,000 feet. But they get pulled up through the thunderstorm systems from the uh, uh, lower elevations and they get perfectly preserved, cryofrozen. And so you can identify the species uh, uh, of the insect, but you can also carbon date it. So it gives you another way to put a time scale uh, on these uh, cores. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of these records from the tropics. Uh, if you look at South America, the uh, uh, the records that we get from the Andes are all uh, records of precipitation that come across the Amazon basin and ultimately out of the tropical Atlantic. And you see the, these are all very high elevation sites. Uh, we're the, the, uh, between the 400 and the 500 millibar level in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, Huascaran is the highest tropical mountain on Earth. And one of the, the big challenges is how you, how you actually get uh, the ice and uh, get your team up there and get back down. Uh, the drill site here is on the call between uh, the South Peak and the North Peak. And uh, to give you a, an example of how that's uh, done, uh, uh, we, we have to take six tons of equipment up to these drill sites. And uh, you have to go across these crevasse fields. And this is a 16 meter ladder that was built in the valley below and brought up uh, to uh, cross this crevasse. And then uh, the people who work on the team actually spent 53 days up on at 20,000 feet drilling the cores and then 10 tons come back down. You've got your drilling equipment plus your So uh, it's quite a, quite a challenge to do this. And we've had to use uh, uh, the, the latest technologies in order to, to make this possible because you can carry these uh, uh, photovoltaic cells up that ladder and assemble your power source to drive the drill. And using this, we were able to uh, recover two cores to bedrock, uh, each of them 168 meters in length. Uh, now, once you get the cores back, they have a, a beautiful record, just like in the polar regions. And many of the parameters are annual. And you can see uh, the annual variation in the oxygen isotope record. Uh, uh, here at nine degrees south of the equator. Uh, because there's a very distinct wet and dry season, you can see it in the dust. And you can also see it in the nitrates, which are modulated by vegetation, uh, NOx uh, emissions in the Amazon upstream from the site. But when we drilled this, uh, air, uh, this site, we were, we were surprised uh, to find that, in fact, the cores are very old. Uh, the record here goes back 19,000 years. <clears throat> so it provided us the first ice that was deposited in the tropics during the last uh, glacial stage, which has been uh, so well developed in the higher latitudes. So in this, uh, in this plot, these are 100-year uh, averages of uh, oxygen isotopes, and this would be the late glacial stage here. There's about a six-part per male depletion that takes place. Uh, these are the nitrate variations that you see here, and they're very low in the late glacial stage. This would suggest less vegetation upwind uh, uh, in, the, in the source area uh, for the nitrate in the Amazon basin. And the dust shows it was very dry at this period of time. But you can also see there's another very big dust event here, which occurred about 4,200 years ago. And it's an interesting event because we also see it over in Africa in the, in the, in the Kilimanjaro cores. And it's, it represents about a, about a 300 year drought uh, in this part of the world. Um, if you go uh, uh, to the tropics, one of the big climate forcings here is El Nino. And it links a lot of our records. 
if you're working in South America, uh, across uh, uh, Indonesia, into Africa. So, uh, uh, and this phenomenon also shows us the importance of the tropics because if you look outside of the seasonal cycle, uh, uh, the El Nino has the biggest impact on our, on our climate over the last uh, 100 years and it impacts climate both in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. And it's a uh, oscillation and the other side, La Nina, uh, is the cold phase of this off the coast of, uh, of, of South America. And, and so th uh, this is an important phenomena and the ice in the tropics provides us a, uh, a history of this. Now, Kilimanjaro is the highest place in Africa, uh, uh, 5,895 meters. Uh, this is the ice that ex exists on the mountain today. It's about three degrees south uh, of the equator. And um, it's, uh, each of these sites uh, in different countries is a challenge. How do, you, how do you recover the core? And how do you get that, all that equipment up there? And for to give you an idea of what six tons of equipment looks like, this is over in Moshi in Africa. And we're always looking for new ways to do this. And so for this project, we joined up with a local businessman and a National Geographic, and we came up with a new uh, transport system, which is shown here. Uh, this is a hot air balloon. And now, uh, the, this is a special balloon. It's an experimental balloon. Uh, Bruce Comstock, the fellow who designed Steve Fawcett's balloon for his around the, trip, around the world trip, designed this balloon. It's in five pieces. It's actually built to be backpacked up to the drill site and to carry the ice cores down to the freezers because on the base of this mountain there's a tropical rainforest and you want to get to the freezers as fast as possible. Uh, the, other, the other challenge, uh, of, of course, uh, uh, is, uh, and you don't learn this at the university, is uh, the permits required to uh, do one of these projects. Uh, to drill Kilimanjaro required 25 permits. And uh, four of them had to do with flying this balloon because a balloon is considered an aircraft and you're going to operate it in another country's airspace, it becomes a big issue. But to make a, a long story short, there were two things that we, we didn't really put enough thought in. One was all those permits, and we got three out of four required. The warden said if we flew the balloon from the summit of Kilimanjaro, uh, they'd have people coming from all over the world to do this. Uh, the local governor said, you know, just tell them it's for science, uh, but uh, uh, it, it didn't work. But in, in the end, uh, uh, the balloon actually saved this project, but in a way we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't understand. The other issue is the pilot. You have to have a pilot who's capable of walking the 20,000 feet and getting in the balloon and flying it off. And we actually found one, we found a pilot in Australia who could actually do that. And, uh, and he actually went to the summit, he spent 11 days up there, and 10 of the days he could have flown the balloon. Uh, but in the end, we had to go to plan B and we hired 92 porters from the villages about at the base of the mountain to move the equipment up to the summit. And so uh, if you go to the summit of Kilimanjaro today, this is what you'll see. These are uh, really a remnant ice field. This is a northern ice field, Fjordwanger in the crater. And uh, one of the things we did was to uh, actually map uh, these ice fields. Uh, had aerial photographs flown. And this is from uh, February 16 of 2000. This is the northern ice field. This is it's a, uh, the crater uh, on the volcano and Fjordwanger and the southern ice field. And we were able to take uh, this map and compare it with all the maps uh, that go back to 1912. And the light blue areas here show the ice. And th this is glaciers on the mountain in 1912. And coming up to the white areas, which are the area of ice that was on the mountain uh, in 2000. Now, if you look at this uh, 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 loss of ice on the mountain, back in 1912, we had 12.1 square kilometers. And by 2000, this is down to something less than 2.6 square kilometers. And if you look at the maps in between and, and area of ice, you can see this is almost a linear uh, decrease in ice. And about 80% had disappeared since 1912. Now, the, the question, uh, and if you project this in the future, you'll see that within, before 2020, the ice fields on Kilimanjaro would disappear. Now the question is what's happened uh, to the ice fields since 2000? And um, uh, we have a good idea of uh, what the last piece of ice is going to look like on this mountain. This is what's left of the eastern uh, ice field, which was quite extensive back in uh, 1962. Uh, 
but we put in stakes in front of these ice walls. This is the northern ice field. And those have been measured four times since the year 2000. And this whole wall, which is 50 meters high, is retreating at 0.9 uh, meters per year. We put stakes on the summit of these ice fields. And since uh, 2000, we've lost one and a half meters of ice uh, from the northern ice field. And this is ice from the surface down. Fjordwanger's lost 1.75 meters. The southern ice field has lost 3.5 meters. And Fjordwanger is uh, at the center, uh, the, the glacier and the, and the crater is only nine meters thick. So these glaciers uh, continue to disappear. And uh, uh, last year, or in 2003, this was observed on the mountain. You have to remember that there are 10,000 tourists that actually go to the summit of this mountain every year. This is the only mountain we've ever drilled that has its own international airport at the base. And you can see the tracks of these tourists coming up here. But in 2003, it was observed a lake bursting out of the side of the Fjordwanger Glacier. And this is water flowing across that site. This is the first time that there's any documentation of water on the summit of Kilimanjaro. <coughs> and ice is a threshold system. Once, if it's minus one degrees, it's fine. But once it starts to melt, uh, uh, it, it goes pretty quickly, and it takes about seven and a half times less energy to melt ice than to sublimate it. And from 1912 up to 2000, the main loss of ice here was uh, mainly through sublimation. So it would suggest that there are, are large changes taking place. So in July of this year, we are going to have aerial photographs uh, uh, reflown of this ice field and map out how much ice has been lost since the year 2000. Now, there, there's some very interesting uh, 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 phenomena in the tropics. And one of these has to do with temperatures. If you look at uh, sea surface temperatures, uh, these, uh, you can see the, uh, the, these are uh, right at the surface of the ocean. And you look at these uh, high temperatures and you look at precipitation, you can see how it follows those uh, temperatures very closely. But if you go up to the 500 millibar level or the 600 millibar level in the Earth's atmosphere, what you see is a very uniform temperature throughout the tropics. And so what's happening to ice, the glaciers, which are located in this zone, uh, is very telling of the Earth's climate system. Uh, every tropical glacier on Earth that we have any documentation on is disappearing in today's world. And uh, I'm going to take you to one of those, uh, the Kilkaya ice cap. This is the largest tropical ice cap that we have. Uh, and if you look at the position here, you can see Lake Titicaca, and this is the Amazon. So the moisture is coming across and up uh, uh, the Andes uh, to this site. Uh, it's, compared to polar glaciers, it's a small ice cap. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, on the surface, and you can see the drill dome up here. And uh, the cores here are remarkable. And when I look back uh, over 20 years ago, we were very fortunate to have chosen this ice field to do the first drilling in the tropics. Because if you look at the cores, you can actually see those annual layers in the core. And these, uh, these, these new cores go back, uh, they're 168 meters in length, and they go back to 200 BC. And they give you an annual record of the, the tropical climate uh, for that period of time. And you can see that record in the parameters that are measured. Uh, these are a couple sections from 50 meters and 90 meters. You can see the annual dust layer as it shows up. You can see it on, on the margins, but you can see it in the measurements. And then as you go deeper in the core, uh, you can see that. But one of the things that we didn't know about the tropics is how robust that isotope signal is uh, that's preserved. Uh, the drilling that we did in 2000 and three was 20 years later, after 20 years of warming. Melting actually started on the summit of this ice field in 1991. And uh, here's a comparison. These are annual isotope values for the last thousand years and uh, uh, from the first core that was drilled back 20 years ago. These came back in 6,000 bottled water samples. We didn't have the capability of, uh, of bringing frozen core back at that time. And they were analyzed in uh, 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 Willie Dansgaard's lab in Denmark, uh, these water samples, and in, in Mincy Stoiver's lab at the University of Washington. Uh, this is an overlap in red showing the annual variations of isotopes in the ice core from the 2003 core. When I left the lab uh, 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 yesterday, uh, the, we were back to 700 AD, and the reproducibility 
is fantastic. And so it, it says that if we can understand what those isotopes are telling us, it's a perfect recorder of the past. But there's also, uh, it makes us very, um, you look at the composite of the isotopes from the tr low latitude ice cores. And here we have decadal isotopes going from zero up to 2000 from, it's a composite of three cores south of the equator and three cores north of the equator from Tibet. And if you look at that record, uh, again, these are decadal, and you come forward in time, you see there's, there's os oscillations in here, and you can see the medieval warm period in here and the little ice age, the cooling that's well documented uh, in Europe and uh, in many mountain areas around the world. But what really stands out is the enrichment in the isotopes in the last 50 years. And you can compare this to our other uh, composite records like Jones and Mann, uh, from, uh, mainly from the tree rings, uh, and then overlap with the instrumental record. But in both of those curves, what really stands out is how unusual the last 50 years have been over this period of time. Uh, we have the ability with these ice cores, because you can see these annual layer thicknesses, to reconstruct what the precipitation has done. When you talk about glaciers, precipitation and temperature are extremely important. So these are decadal precipitation records from 1600 coming forward. The blues are wet periods, and these are dry periods. And if you come into the 20th century, you can see uh, that it's been wetter than average. So all things being equal, you would expect the glaciers uh, to actually be advancing uh, at the, uh, through the 20th century. Uh, other records coming from uh, uh, Tibetan Plateau, these are sites that have been drilled. This will be our next drill site, uh, Nanunami, here in the far southwestern Himalayas. But I'm going to take you to one record uh, right in the center of Tibet uh, to give you an idea of the, the, uh, how these uh, records are recorded in a remote part of the world. If you go out there, there are no roads. Uh, so uh, you have to make your own road into these sites. There are sand dunes out there that move during the spring. These sand dunes actually lap up against the ice fields. Uh, and if you look at the margin of the Puragongri ice field, you can see those annual spring layers, and these are like the steps in this lecture hall. And there's over 2,000 of these just walking up on the margin of the ice field. Uh, and when you drill the cores here, like those in South America, you can see each of those dry seasons. And so we were able to actually date these back to 82 BC, just counting those annual layers. Now, each of these sites has its own challenges as to how you get the ice out. Uh, and if you're working over in the Himalayas, to give you just an example of how that's done, uh, you use what's available. And uh, uh, these are yaks, and these are insulated core boxes. And in each of those boxes, we have uh, uh, six meters of ice core. So 12 meters per yak. We drill 500 to 600 meters of core per project. So you can get an idea of how many are required just to move the cores from the edge of the ice down to where the trucks are. So, uh, so there's a lot that goes into the logistics. But if you go to the center of Tibet and you look at the isotope rock, very remote ice cap, uh, you can see uh, the mean values are shown here. This is the entire record. And what you can see here is the most enriched isotopes uh, in the history of this ice field occur in the last 50 years in this part uh, of the world. So, uh, so the change you can see in the core. But there's another thing. Over the time of going out and collecting these cores, we've also collected some photographs to show the changes that are taking place. And you can go to the U.S. Senate and you can talk about isotopes, but you will not get very far. Pictures. Pictures work miracles. But uh, so I'm going to start very high uh, in Alaska, up in the Brooks Range, and I'm going to show some some uh, uh, changes that have taken place. Uh, this is the McCall Glacier as it appeared in 1958. This is what it looks like in 2003. If you go to southeast Alaska, here's the Muir Glacier, 1941, and this is the same site, and this is what it looked like in 2004. This glacier was over 800 meters thick uh, in this valley, and it's retreated 15 kilometers up the valley. USGS is monitoring 2,000 glaciers in southeast Alaska. 1,987 are retreating. Uh, so uh, it's a pretty uh, uh, pervasive uh, 
uh, signal in that part of the world. We spent a, lo a lot of time, 20 years working in China, and in, in the, throughout the, uh, the Tibet, you see this same picture. Uh, th uh, this is glacier number one in the Tian Shan, but these two glaciers in 1960 are connected. By 1990, they're separating. By 2001, they've separated. Uh, glacier National Park here in the, in the U.S. Uh, this is the Grinnell Glacier, a uh, photo from 1910, and then, uh, the Boulder, uh, uh, and then the same place in 1998, and then the Boulder Glacier in 1932, and you see people here for scale in the same place in 1988. It's estimated that within 30 years, there'll be no glaciers in Glacier National Park. Uh, Kilimanjaro in Africa. Uh, the oldest photo we could find was taken in 1912. And you can see these are glaciers coming down off the, off the summit of the mountain. Uh, Bruno Meserle took this photo in 1970. And you can see a, uh, this canyon starting to open up on the top of the mountain. And this is from our uh, photo from uh, the year 2000. Uh, I think this is a, a telling uh, quote. This is from John Mercer. It was published in Nature in 1978. This is one of the warning signs that a dangerous warming trend is underway in Antarctica will be the breakup of ice shelves on both coasts of the Antarctic Peninsula, starting with the northernmost and extending gradually to the south. And he got uh, a lot of flack over this back in 1978. But if you look at what's happened in this region, uh, uh, temperatures have warmed in the last 50 years, two and a half degrees C. And if you look at the dates on the breakup of these ice shelves, you can see how they're progressing southward. And it's true on both sides of the peninsula. And uh, so I, I think it was very telling of, uh, of John to see this uh, back in, in 1978. If you go to the southern tip of South America, uh, here's a photograph taken in 1945. You can see a, a lake here. This is the same place in 1998. Uh, if you go to the northern part of Patagonia, uh, and uh, you look at a photo from 1896, uh, you can see the, the glacier coming down here. By 2001, it's practically disappeared. So uh, this is a big signal that you see on glaciers around the world. It turns out now that Kelkaya, and particularly Corey Kalis here, is the best documented retreat story in the tropics. Uh, because back in 1978, we set up a baseline up on this bedrock ridge overlooking this valley to map this glacier for signs of global warming, but just to see how tropical glaciers behave. And this is a photograph from 1978 taken from that uh, baseline. And it's a fairly healthy glacier, convex, very little water at the tip of it. Uh, this is what it looked like in 2002. Uh, this lake, which started forming in 1991, now covers uh, 78 acres. And uh, this retreat is characteristic uh, around uh, this ice cap. But here's a series of photographs, so you can actually see the lake forming, coming uh, forward in time. And this is the retreat that's taken place. And if you map that out here, what you see is that back in 63 to 78, the terminus of that glacier is retreating 4.7 meters per year. By 2000 to 2002, it's up over 200 meters per year. So it's about a 40 times increase in the rate of ice loss. And if you uh, look at this place in 2004, the retreat continues. And we took a sonar, and we actually mapped out this lake. And the lake uh, in the center is about 60 meters, or over 200 feet deep. And it didn't exist until 1991. So if you uh, look at the things that we know with certainty from this evidence from the ice, uh, uh, we know that uh, glaciers are disappearing, and along with them, a very valuable paleoclimate archive is being lost. And you could stop uh, uh, with the, when you're looking at these ice fields with just this statement, because it really doesn't matter whether, from the glacier standpoint and loss of record, whether it's human-driven or natural. The fact is that the archives are being lost. Uh, the loss of these glaciers, and they can be considered the world's water towers, uh, threaten resources, and those impact hydroelectric power production, crop irrigation, municipal water supplies. They're already impacting uh, uh, areas in the Andes as well as over in the Himalayas. Uh, the loss of the glaciers around the world has also have a direct impact on tourism. Uh, if you look at Kilimanjaro, 
Uh, Kilimanjaro is the number one foreign currency earner for the government of Tanzania. And they're debating in Congress right now uh, how many tourists will come to Kilimanjaro when there's no more glaciers there, because that's the drawing card for it. And I think it's, a, and it's, a, it's an important, uh, important debate. Uh, now, one of the issues that you, you always find is, okay, how do you know this is unusual? I mean, you, our, our history of mapping, uh, actually photographs, is very limited, and we know glaciers have advanced and retreated through time. Well, one of these ways is through the uh, ice cores themselves, and we drilled three cores to bedrock from the northern ice field on Kilimanjaro, and you can actually see the change in the ice, in the physical condition of the ice itself. On a normal glacier, you have snow, it den densifies the fern, and it becomes ice, and it looks like this. These ice cores are 51 meters in length. All the ice looks like this, except the top 65 centimeters, which you see here, and you see these very large 15 centimeter uh, uh, bubbles in the ice. And the only way this forms is when you have melting and refreezing. Had this occurred in the 11,700 year history on Kilimanjaro, you would see it. In the, uh, in the physical evidence in the ice itself. But there's another way that you can look at what, uh, put a perspective on the change in these glaciers. This is a quote from Sir Ernest Shackleton in 1915, what the ice gets, the ice keeps. Uh, he was talking about his ship, but it's true about the, uh, the ice itself. So as these glaciers retreat, there are things coming out of the ice. And uh, this is the margin of Kelkaya, a different place, but this lake did not exist in 1977. You can see the retreat, all this uh, fresh rock surface here. And uh, in 2002, of this lake, uh, uh, we found a plant deposit. Uh, this is what this area looked like in 1977. There's no lake in here, there's people here for scale. But uh, right here, this is a person, this is the backside of the lake, so this is a 30 meter wall that's retreating. And right at the base here is a plant deposit. And it's a interesting deposit uh, in that it's uh, two meters across. It's a wetland plant, there's no woody tissue. And <coughs> uh, so this plant tells us a lot. It tells us it had to be warmer in the past because it was growing at this site. And the fact that it's a soft bodied plant, perfectly preserved, says that whatever happened to capture this plant had to be uh, abrupt. So we collected the plant and we, we had it carbon dated and we had uh, some experts here at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, Blanca Leon and Ken Young, uh, to look at the plant and this is what it is, it's Distitua discoides. Uh, this is the collection site, this is what it looks like in the modern world and this is the age of the plant, it's 5,000 old. <coughs> the, the interesting thing about this is that uh, back to this uh, <coughs> ice cap, this is another valley, three kilometers from the first collection. This is 2004. This whole peninsula is covered by wetland plants that are rooted. These plants also date 5,000 years in age. And uh, so you, you start asking the question, okay, what was happening uh, at this time? And you look around the world at things that have come out of the ice. Uh, this is Utsi, uh, uh, the, the ice man who came out of the Austrian Alps in uh, 1991. Interesting thing is he's perfectly preserved. Uh, he was shot in the back with uh, an arrow. He escaped his captors. He sat down behind a boulder at the top of the Alps and he bled to death. But shortly after he died, he had to be covered by snow. And it had to be deep enough to bury him so that he was not eaten, he didn't decay and he came out of the ice in 1991. So, uh, and this is north of the equator, and you have this very abrupt event. So, uh, since finding the plan in 2002, we've been looking around at various records, and I'll just show a few of them here, that are interesting in this regard. If you look at the isotope record from uh, Kilimanjaro, you have to go back 5,200 years to get back to isotopes of equal magnitude as those in today's world. So uh, one idea is it may be uh, the division between the hypsothermal, the earlier in many places in the world, uh, earlier Holocene warm period, and the neoglacials that came in later Holocene. If you look at the isotope record from Kilimanjaro, it's the lowest 
isotope values in 11,700 year history. Uh, <coughs> if you look at the methane records from the polar ice cores, 5,200 years ago is the lowest methane levels both in Antarctica and Greenland uh, in those cores. Uh, this is a uh, biliothem record from the Sorek cave uh, in southern Israel and you can see it's the lowest isotope uh, value record and that's uranium thorium dating. So <coughs> it raises the question of uh, this <coughs> abrupt event, whether it does rec uh, represent a transition between uh, what came in the early part of the Holocene and the cooler uh, uh, late Holocene, the glacial period. Uh, it asks the, the question, uh, do these abrupt nonlinear events result from linear climate forcing, which would be or could be uh, the tropical northern hemisphere solar insulation changes over this time. Maybe there's a threshold uh, that is passed. And the question of whether are there critical thresholds in the natural system and uh, very important for when we look forward uh, to the future. And then um, what is the role of nonlinear feedbacks in the climate system? Uh, but it's very interesting that we found the plan in 2002 and we've been mapping out places where there are very good dated abrupt events at this time. And th this sh all these stars show where uh, uh, this has been found. Uh, tree ring records, annual tree ring records from Ireland and England. It goes back 7,000 years. The narrowest tree ring record is 5,100 and 94 years ago. Uh, you, can you can look uh, at these, these records around the world. So it's, it's a large scale event occurring in the warm period that we're currently, currently living in. Uh, if we come back to the 20th century and we look at the world and look at what's happening to glaciers, uh, this map, all those red areas show loss of ice. And uh, these are documented. And up until uh, earlier this year, this was actually a blue site up in uh, Norway and uh, uh, in Sweden. And it was believed that the, uh, the precipitation that used to come uh, mainly into the Alps here uh, in storms had a more northerly track. They're getting more winter snowfall. Uh, just since 1999, most of these glaciers in this sector are also retreating in today's world. So it's a pretty consistent picture coming from the ice, uh, and particularly from the, from the mountain regions. So what are the consequences of melting glaciers? Uh, the loss of nature's water towers. Uh, some people refer to them as the crown jewels of the Earth's system. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, th this is documented around the world and in many places you can document increasing rates of loss. If you look at ice on Earth, and we heard a lot about the polar regions earlier today, that's where most of the ice is located, uh, 32 million cubic kilometers. But there's still about 100,000 cubic kilometers locked up in the mountain glaciers around the world. And if you look at sea level rise just from the loss, mel melting mountain glaciers and thermal expansion of the oceans, you're looking at something around a half a meter. And that's, not, that's not very much when you compare how much water could come from the polar ice sheets, but it's important to people because you would displace over 100 million people in Bangladesh alone with that type of sea level rise. And we know those mountain glaciers are uh, the day's climate. I want to come to the human side of this. Uh, often when we talk about 6.4 billion people, we it's hard to visualize. I think these uh, uh, space shuttle uh, shots of the Earth at night uh, really show the impact that we are having on this planet. And, uh, and I, uh, there's a, a from, uh, uh, Lester Brown's uh, 2003 book, as the world population has doubled in the last 50 years, the global economy has actually uh, increased or expanded by sevenfold over that period of time. And he argues that we're, uh, we're now demanding more from the Earth than it is capable of sustaining. And he suggests that we have created a global bubble economy in this process. If uh, you look at the, uh, uh, the measured uh, CO2 curve, the, the Keeling's curve, uh, you can see this increase uh, taking place and then overlap it with the ice core records that we heard about earlier today. Uh, the impact of human beings on the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. And we uh, again looked at this record back uh, through time and also at the temperature records for the Earth. Uh, if you look at, uh, this is based on our instrumental records. This is the best documentations that we have. Uh, 1998 being the warmest year on record. Uh, 2002 being the second warmest, 2003 
the third in 2004, the fourth warmest, uh, 11 of the warmest years on record in the last 15 years. And, and the question of the uh, connectedness to the increases in CO2. Uh, we, we, we also looked at uh, 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 these curves earlier today showing the, uh, the glacial cycles and, and carbon dioxide uh, going back 420,000 years, and now that goes back to 680,000, uh, uh, showing the, uh, the maximums of being uh, less than 300 parts per million by volume in, uh, uh, at the glacial cooling, uh, the minimums being around 200 parts per million by volume. But then you look at where we are today, and you see that there's n we're in a no analog situation. And then, of course, if you look at those projections in the next hundred years, and if you look at the, the range of projections, uh, it, it's amazing uh, if uh, any of this comes to pass. And we spent the last 20 years working in China, and we've been watching the development there. Uh, in 2004, uh, in China, they consumed 50 percent of the world's cement, 40 percent of the steel, and 30 percent of the oil. And the economy is just developing in that part of the world. So. Uh, uh, I, 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 when you look at this picture that's taking place, it's really hard to see that. Out. And then so it comes to a question of who pays the cost and when do we as people actually re react to something like this? Well, I think history says who pays the cost are probably those who have the least to do with causing the change and who are least able to adapt to that change. This is a Quechua Indian girl just uh, below the Kalkaya ice cap. There's, uh, there, there's the question of, you know, these are the options. We can ignore it, do nothing. We let the market forces work its way through this. That's our current policy. We could choose to mitigate it. We could actually invest in some of these uh, uh, alternative fuels, uh, photovoltaic cells, wind power, hybrids. Uh, there's a lot of things we could do if we were willing to make that investment. Then the other thing is that we could choose, and we will have to, adapt, adapt to change. So those are really our options. So it becomes a question of when, as people, do we do something about this? And this is my, my personal take, having China and having uh, my, my daughter actually uh, has a degree in Chinese, uh, you look at uh, crisis. This is, this is how people behave if you look at the hi our history. And in Chinese, this is Wei Ji. But it's interesting that there are two characters uh, for um, crisis. And the first one, you would guess, and that is uh, danger. Uh, Wei means danger. And certainly every crisis means, uh, brings danger with it. But uh, G means opportunity, opportunity to make things better. Now, I'm going to give a couple examples of this. We had a river in Ohio, the Cuyahoga River, that was polluted. We knew it was polluted. There was lots of publications for 15 years. And then one day it caught on fire. That was a crisis. Now, once it caught on fire, uh, it was determined that we probably should do something. And so they cleaned it up. And today, there are walleye and pike in that river. It wasn't that we couldn't do it. We just didn't have to do it. And sometimes you, you, uh, you think this is a, a political issue. I'm, I don't think it's political. I think it's human nature. And you can go back and you can look at soil conservation in this country. Hugh Bennett, father of soil conservation. He was in Washington all through the 1920s. There were congressional hearings on the farming practices in the Midwest, in the West, in this country. Went through uh, uh, the 20s. Uh, it was 1931 when there was a huge dust storm that came out of Oklahoma. There was 12 million tons of dust that fell on Chicago. He had a friend. He was in, in Washington. There was going to be a congressional hearing. He had a friend who caught him to tell him about this dust storm. And so he delayed the hearing. So right in the middle of his presentation, the dust from Oklahoma hit Washington, D.C. The policy changed 180 degrees at that moment, but it didn't change until that time. And so it, uh, uh, it, it raises the issues of whether we have institutions that can deal with uh, a problem like carbon dioxide, uh, in that this gas, once it's released, is, has a residence time of over 100 years. 
So if we wait for the crisis to take action on this, we will have already built in a series of crises that we'll have to deal with. So it's different than the local problem in the Cuyahoga River or even the national problem with farming practices. This is a global problem and it requires uh, a global solution and it requires all of us working together to find those solutions. So uh, thank you very much and I appreciate your attention and then I'd <laughs> be glad to entertain questions. Thank you very much, Lonnie. Dr. Thompson would be happy to answer a couple of questions. If you do have to leave, please be really quiet when you do. Thanks. Who has a question for Dr. Thompson? about our uh, fuel, uh, oil, running out of oil and uh, turning to coal. And coal is uh, one of the biggest uh, CO2 emitters uh, that we have as fossil fuels. I was at an energy conference at General Electric two weeks ago and, and we, there were companies uh, from fossil fuel industry to uh, uh, photovoltaic cells, uh, hybrids, wind, uh, technology, uh, looking for, for solutions. And one of the, uh, uh, the issues uh, is that in any economy to make transitions to a different type of energy form takes 20, 30, 40 years. And you know, in this country we talk about going to uh, hydrogen economy, but the consensus was that's at least 50 years out. And so what do we do in the, in the meantime? And uh, one of the participants indicated that there have been contracts given to 850 new coal burning power plants in the U.S., China, and India. And these contracts have already been issued, which means those plants will be built. And uh, so I, uh, this is why I, I think that if, if, uh, if we, uh, it almost takes this crisis situation in order for us to really set up and take notice of these changes. If you go to a place like uh, China with all these new constructions and cities, you know, they have brownouts now because there's not enough there's not enough power on the grid. We have similar problems here in the U.S. And the solution is to build coal burning power plants because there's no guarantee that the oil is going to be there. There are issues with natural gas, which are actually the preferable uh, uh, energies for powering those plants. But coal, we have lots of. And that's, that's human nature. We go to the easiest, cheapest, most readily available. So, so it's kind of discouraging there. Yes? There was a uh, expedition, an Australian expedition there in the, in the mid-70s. Uh, I saw a photograph from this site uh, uh, taken in 2004. Uh, it's the Marin and Cartens Glacier there. Uh, the Marin is gone. Uh, the Cartens is still there. There's still some ice. It's the only ice body in the center of the warm pool. So there's a question of whether, I don't think the record would be very good uh, as far as interpreting it, but maybe 20 years from now, it would be doable uh, to interpret that record and whether it would be a good idea to get, a, get an archive from there and preserve it for the future. But it's, it's disappearing very quickly, just like all the other tropical glaciers. Yes? Ecotourism is a big industry now. And from your perspective on ice, if you were starting college today, where would be the one place you would like to go if to see something that won't be 
around in 20 years? Kilimanjaro. I, I think uh, if, uh, yeah, if you have plans to, to go to see the ice on Kilimanjaro, you should do that soon. Um, they, uh, uh, we, we, there was a mountaineer who just came back three weeks ago. And the northern ice field, there's a, there was a hole that developed between the last aerial photographs, which were taken in 1989, and ours in 2000. <coughs> that northern ice field has now split in two. It's actually separated. And I think this presence of water suggests that the loss of ice is actually accelerating on that mountain. And that's why we want to do a, a five-year assessment to see if, um, when you look at that projection for the future, if actually uh, uh, the rate of ice loss is increasing. But that would be, that would be the mountain uh, to go to. Uh, I, I think there will be a lot of, uh, I think it's, it could be an icon for, certainly for climate change in Africa, because uh, it's so popular. You know, Ernest Hemingway made it uh, popular, the snows of Kilimanjaro, there are movies about it. Uh, and I found that people need to relate. If you're going to make a difference, and it's going to become real, they need to see it. If once people see these changes, uh, then they become concerned. So uh, that would be my first choice. Yes? What do you think is the biggest question that's still open that you can get data from these ice cores? The biggest question that we could get data from from these ice cores? Well, I, I think the, the history of monsoon variability, uh, inso variability, uh, we know these systems have had tremendous changes. Uh, there, there, there was a huge event uh, in uh, 1790 to 1797. Uh, it shows up at the top of the Himalayas, a, a huge dust peak increase in, in, uh, in isotopes, uh, chemistry. It's also a big event in South America. But it was also a big event in San Francisco. And it's a, it's a time of the French Revolution in, in Europe. And uh, if you go back in time, and, and this new Kilkaya core is, is, is amazing in this regard, because 20 years ago, we couldn't do chemistry. I mean, we brought back water samples. And even the dust was suspect, because everything was in solution for six months before it got back to the lab. But now we can do a whole suite of chemistry. And when you look at that, there are two parameters that show changes that you don't see in any, any others, uh, uh, fluoride and chloride. They show a huge event. 1790 to 1797, and also 1340 to 1350. And this is the time of the, uh, uh, the outbreak of the plague in Europe. Uh, and you know, what role does climate play uh, in human history? And in South America, the Spanish arrived in 1531. There are huge cities, cultures like the Mochi culture, uh, developed uh, at uh, uh, the time of the birth of Christ. And came to an abrupt end in 600 AD. Within 50 years, a culture where they built the largest uh, uh, adobe structures in the Western Hemisphere, Waco del Sol, Waco del Luno, uh, suddenly this whole culture disappeared. And in these ice cores, we see two back-to-back -back droughts lasting 30 years. And what the impact has been through history on culture and human beings, uh, I mean, they're, they're, we usually, uh, uh, use causes like wars, and, uh, but usually th there's some reason there's a war. There's starvation, there's some disruption in the system, and how societies react to that. But getting this annual history in places where we have no record uh, gives us a, another vision of uh, what went on in those times. So these are, uh, these are things that we, we need to get from, from these records. Yes. Have you considered uh, reducing the size of your cores uh, to improve the technology, to make it faster, and to make the uh, um, transportation of the results uh, easier? It's always, it's always a, uh, a dilemma uh, because you, you do have this weight issue uh, in the amount of core, but the chances of you getting funded again to go back to one of these sites is so slim that uh, you want to get as much ice as you can. And we, we keep an archive. I mean, we do the analysis, publish the papers, but we keep an archive for the future because we know our technology, our, uh, uh, our ability to understand these records will continue to improve, but you have to have the archive to work on. So we try to get as much ice as we possibly can. And, uh, Can we project past the oldest ice into other records? 
Well, I, I think the, the comparison of records, paleoclimate records, in these different regions is probably the future, uh, 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 really important future area for development in paleoclimatology. How do you, how do you compare uh, 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 corals, marine cores, lake cores, uh, and, and, and really connect these? The trees growing in the same place where, where the glaciers are. Uh, yeah, how, do you, how do you bring these records together so you can really develop a global picture and you can also use these other archives to take the history back further in time. Yes. This, uh, this is too complex a subject for you to really deal with, but perhaps you could recommend a, a book or author. And I, I think it's something like the 15th or 16th century. Uh, Spain had massive lead smelting operations that caused quite a bit of climatic changes. I'm wondering if anybody's ever done any work change, uh, examining that and trying it to what's happening today and trying to make extrapolations. Well, there have been people who have looked at lead uh, in polar ice cores, and you can see uh, the smelting in, in Rome. Uh, I mean, this, once it gets in the atmosphere, it, goes, it, it gets widely distributed. And there's one of the issues in South America. Uh, metallurgy was developed before the Spanish actually arrived there, but we don't have any calendars, any timing on that. And by looking at uh, the heavy metals in, the, uh, in these ice cores, uh, it's, it's possible that we could actually date uh, when this started. Some, yes. Yeah, other types of gas when smelting, for sure. I, I don't know of any books that would bring that together. Living plants. Uh, no, but the, the plants, I, I, I talked about the 5,200 year. We, we, we did a third collection in uh, uh, 2004, and the plant dates over, over 50,000 years. It's carbon dead. It's a, it's, a, a, it's a wetland plant, soft tissue, but perfectly preserved. And I think uh, we're going back to this site to, to, to collect the, and look at this, the, the setting because well, I, the only way I know that soft body plant could be preserved for over 50,000 years, it's been under ice. And if that's true, then it gives you a, it would say that this retreat that's taking place, certainly in that valley on the Kelkaya ice cap, is greater than it has been in over 50,000 years. And, and it raises a whole new issue at, uh, up at the GE conference. There's a guy from Energy Department. And uh, they, they fund a, a genomics lab for mapping DNA. And the possibility of looking at DNA in these plants and comparing it to DNA in plants that are growing in the same area today, to look at evolution. Because I think this is probably the oldest soft body plant uh, that's been, been collected. And so, so they're very interested. And then you also find that at Ohio State, we have a seed center, a seed institute. I didn't even know it. I mean, we're, we're a big university, just like University of Texas here at Austin. But uh, I got a call from the director, and the question was, are there any seeds associated with these plants? And what he really wants to know is, did they germinate? Mm -hmm. no. Could you, uh, so so I, I think as these glaciers retreat, uh, there, there's a field that's being developed. It's time sensitive because these are soft bodied uh, organic tissue and it will decay as soon as it's exposed. But in this period that uh, you have the opportunity not only in South America, but I think in uh, other parts of the world to actually collect and date the last time that glacier was as small as it is today. And you can start putting a time history on what we've observed in the 20th century. Yes? What has Pollen showed you throughout time? What's some of the biggest questions that your answers you've come up with? Well, I, th I think the, the, uh, they're, they're, uh, we work with Canby U. Lou down at Louisiana State on the pollen records in these cores. And uh, if you look at Sahama, uh, uh, in Bolivia. This is, will be the next pollen record to come from an ice core. Uh, that record goes back 25,000 years. And it's, when you look at LGM, there's no pollen uh, in, this, uh, in this core. It really comes during the bowling allerid period. It comes in very abruptly. Uh, the, and there's some questions about uh, you know, partial pressure of CO2 on these plateaus. The higher you go, the lower the CO2. And if you get a combination of colder temperatures, five to six degrees colder, low CO2 during glacial maximum, what's the limit at which plants can actually operate on these plateaus? 
And I mean, that's a question for the Alapano and Bolivia and, and southern Peru, but also Tibet. Uh, but, uh, but you can actually do a confirmation of the precipitation history that we developed from the cores themselves by looking at how the plants responded, whether they're, they're grasses or, 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 or a, uh, a dry indicators of, of climate. So uh, uh, it's, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a wonderful archive. There, there are issues about you know, how much pollen and what pollen gets to 6,000 meters in the Earth's atmosphere. We don't have good, uh, good records, good transport models for that. So there, there, there are issues like that that comes with looking at those records. But they're, uh, they're well preserved and we're looking at uh, 4,000 to 5,000 grains of pollen per liter of water. If you look at a polar core, you get zero to maybe seven. In Alaska, you get to, you get pollen in southeast Alaska because you've got the spruce forest and you've got sources uh, in the area. Uh, and uh, likewise, on the, on, and if you're in the Alapano in in uh, uh, Peru, you're getting you get birches coming out of the Amazon, the upper uh, levels of the mountains. Uh, forest in the, on the Amazon side, but then you also get the grasses, pollen coming from, uh, off the drier areas. So, so they're, they're a good record. I think there's a lot that could be done with that archive. Yes? Um, could you contrast your uh, data in the mountain glaciers with the uh, ice age uh, geometry of, of the Earth that we're going to go through for an ice age cycle? I, I think there's a lot to, lot to be done there. One of the things we're looking at is the timing at which ice grows at different latitudes. And if you, if you look at the cores we have now, what you see is that uh, Sahama starts 25,000 years ago, uh, Waskaran 19,000, Kilimanjaro 11,700. You get to the Himalayas, those cores start about 9,000 years ago. Uh, uh, the, uh, where we have the glacial stage uh, preserved, you can look at the isotopes, you can look at the, and it's remarkable, the isotopic shifts that you see in the tropics are exactly what you see in central Greenland and down in uh, central Antarctica for glacial maxima. Right, but the ice age comes in our particular planet from the north to the south, is that correct? Uh, no, I think uh, the ice ages are uh, uh, global in their, in their nature, so uh, it's, it's an issue of where, where uh, uh, you know, if you look at the longer term, it's a Milankovitch forcing that, uh, and it's a global signal. Which the last issue? Bill Rudiman. Bill Rudiman. 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 Yes, so we had a long discussion earlier today uh, on this, and uh, the uh, uh, it's uh, considered by some prominent people as being uh, a myth, uh, uh, and. Uh, and I, but, you know, I think the discussion of looking at uh, that change, and of course it occurs 5,200 years ago where this, this flex point uh, changes. But this is going to be answered. The science is out there. I mean, you can do the isotopes uh, on the methane and determine sources. So, so I don't think uh, uh, it'll be an issue very long. Yes? Um, one of the most common questions I get when I tell people I'm a climate scientist is that they do think global warming is real. So, so people seem to be aware that there is this, or they, they're aware of the idea of global warming, but they, they seem pretty ignorant about the, uh, the the overwhelming evidence that there is for it. Do you think that as climate scientists we failed in communicating this to the public? I think there's a, there's a real need to get the real evidence for change out to a larger public. Uh, I, I still think there is an issue about when you actually bring about changes in policy uh, and what it takes to do that. I think the surveys would indicate that most people believe that global warming is occurring. Uh, but most of them believe that you can't do anything about it. A and uh, I, I think that what we really need to work on is looking at what is. I mean, a lot of people, it's a belief system, and it's, it's not a belief system. I mean, uh, it, science deals with what is or isn't, and the evidence is overwhelming that the Earth is getting warmer, uh, whether you look at temperature records or what's happening to glaciers or the like. Uh, 
but how do you get that message out to a large number of people and particularly how do you get it to uh, congressmen and senators in this country in order to bring about changes in policy uh, is, a, is a very, very important area to develop. And we spent a lot of time and effort in BBC specials, CNN specials, and all of this is what we consider outreach, uh, education, because I, uh, I think when you see the evidence, it's, it's very compelling. Uh, but I think we do also have to put a lot of effort into solutions, because to show change and show what's going on without having some viable solutions uh, uh, it, it gets us into big problems. But I think in this country, things like conservation should be number one. I mean, there's certainly enough evidence out there that we should be looking at conservation. And, but one of the things that came from General Electric that I was really positive is that we didn't sign the Kyoto Protocol, but our companies are global. So their products have to meet. Uh, so uh, so, so in, in some ways we would have been much better off of joining the rest of the world and going uh, with this because uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a global world and global economies and you sell your products around the world and they have to meet these standards. So uh, we're going to change anyway. Yes. I have occasionally people say, well, nuclear energy is the answer, uh, as opposed to the coal or whatever else, especially for climate change. To me, that's a, you know, jumping from the kettle into the fire. But uh, what, if, what would you say to that? Uh, I, I think that uh, certainly the consensus of this meeting is that the solutions will be a mix for different energy, and nuclear was one of them. Uh, I mean, I think we've come a long ways with that technology, but you, but you do have to worry about the pollution side of this and coming up with places to store, safe places to store the nuclear waste. And this is something we've been wrestling with in this country for, for decades, and we don't yet have a, have a solution. But I was amazed we had people from France. You know, in France, 80% of their electricity comes from nuclear. But right across the border in Germany, they're outlawing the building of nuclear plants. And the vicinity, you know, they're so close. <laughs> I mean, you wonder uh, you know, what's, the, uh, what's the rationale here. But, uh, uh, but I think it's probably part. Last question for uh, Dr. Thompson. You've had your hand up for a long time. How much have you studied on a larger time scale or time frame? Anything, are you familiar with uh, the snowball earth theory? Uh, I am familiar with that, yes. Um, over a larger time scale, have you done any studying about patterns or anything? Uh, only looking at what other people have done. Our ice core records don't go right. cover that time scale. The oldest record we have uh, from the mountain glaciers from, from western China, uh, from uh, the Glee ice cap, and that goes back about uh, 760,000 years. But it's, it doesn't address that, that longer time right. scale. Right. I was wondering if you sort of put that into a larger picture to see if it fit into a pattern. Put well, what you've learned into a larger time frame. Well, well, certainly, if you look at the history of the Earth, we've gone through these uh, cold glacial stages. There have right. been many of them that have occurred, and uh, uh, we're, we happen to be in one now. But I think what really makes our world different, uh, if you look at the earlier, earlier history and you look at levels of CO2 when we didn't have ice, like in the Cretaceous, and you look at the world today, I don't think there's been a time when CO2 levels have been as high as today when we still had so much ice right. on land. And it's, uh, uh, I think that's what makes it different. And, and so many people that whose infrastructure will be uh, impacted by changes of the amount of ice that's on, on the land by, by a warming earth. So it's, so it's really a human impact from that that makes our world different than those earlier periods. Well, I'd like to end with a comment following up on the question about what climate scientists can do to uh, help make people aware of this is that uh, Lonnie Thompson is one of the climate scientist who probably spends a lot of his time uh, doing just this, outreaching to the public and trying to explain complex scientific issues to the public and policymakers and things like that. And so I think it's very much a step in the right direction. He won't tell you how much he does, but he spends an awful lot of his time. And every, all the time he's doing that, he's not doing his science. So um, on that note, let's thank Dr. Thompson for his talk. Thank you. Thank you.